This is a lecture for my administrative law class and also my legislation and regulation class about um, Buckley v. Vallejo, that Supreme Court case regarding the Federal Election Commission. Okay, Buckley v. Vallejo, this is a 1976 case. Bottom line about the holding of this case, the Federal Election Commission Act violated the appointments clause because most of the commission members were not appointed by the president. So again, this fits into our course when we're talking about appointment and removal powers. And this is one of our big cases in the area that's in almost every administrative law casebook. So just by way of quick introduction, the statute here created that created the Federal Election Commission was supposed to be bipartisan and also balance the different branches of government to provide oversight so that we wouldn't have one party controlling the commission that um, provided oversight for the elections and out of concerns that that party would be biased in its decisions or try, try to tilt the elections in their favor. So the way they set it up was that there would be two commissioners who were appointed by the president, one from each and ha one had to be from each party, two appointed by the Speaker of the House and two appointed by the President Pro Tem of the Senate. And again, um, each one of these individuals from the leader of each House of Congress and then the president had to come up with a Republican and a Democrat. And then all the commissioners had to be confirmed by both the House and, uh, and the Senate. So remember the constitution only talks about Senate confirmation and this was a, a, one of the kind of rare attempts of Congress to say the House should get to confirm these people too. Now, uh, hopefully you have red flags going off about the appointments clause already. I do wanna note that Buckley v. Vallejo is more famous actually for its sections about restraints on campaign finance and so, um, it was it, some many legal scholars see it as the precursor to the Citizens United case that you might have studied in your constitutional law class. So there's a section of Buckley v. Vallejo that's really about campaign finance um, and an issue with that that's usually not in the excerpt that's in administrative law case books. Now, when you're looking at this case, think about the nature of the separation of powers challenge to the agency, right? So we do have two of the people appointed by the president, and then we have the other four members appointed by people besides the president. At the same time, think about that the Supreme Court did not uphold that challenge based on some rigid characterization of the FEC's functions as exclusively executive. So in a lot of these appointment powers cases, you may remember, or as, as you go through this whole unit of cases, that a lot of the um, court's analysis in older cases was about how executive is this agency. And the more executive it was, the more they thought the president should have complete control. The court notes that the investigative and informative functions of the FEC could have been assigned to actually to congressional committees and that its rulemaking and advisory opinion functions are arguably more legislative or judicial than executive in character. In other words, the Federal Elections Commission was doing a lot of stuff that wasn't purely um, executive. And it, depending on the order that your casebook goes in, sometimes this, a lot of times this case comes before Humphrey's executor, where the court lays out this rubric for analysis, analytical rubric to look at whether the agency in question is performing executive or other legislative or judicial type functions. And the court here acknowledges the Federal Elections Commission is making rules and sometimes bringing enforcement actions and, um, and sometimes kind of a ju acting very judicial and deciding um, to settling disputes or deciding doing hearings and so forth. So the court's reasoning goes less to a formal ca categorization of agency activity than to a functional understanding of what the appointments clause was intended to accomplish, which the, this case says was the exclusion of Congress from direct administrative control. In other words, they, the court finds a separation of powers problem because they say that it's implied in the existence of an appointments clause that the branches of government are source, supposed to stay in their own lanes a little bit. And this was allowing Congress to have 
one foot or two feet in, um, in a, is something that was an executive branch function. So under Buckley, any appointee responsible for performance of a significant governmental duty exercised pursuant to a public law of the United States is an officer of the United States and therefore has to be appointed in the manner prescribed by Article 2, Section 2. And the court says that this interpretation best implements the Constitution's intended prohibition against the direct congressional involvement in the implementation of law. So instead of focusing just on the functions of the agency, for this is a different type of separation of powers analysis that's a little more of a checks and balances or like we need its separation as opposed to powers. And though Congress may indirectly enhance its influence over officers by limiting the president's powers of removal in some cases, like that's what Humphrey's executor is about, the court deems congressional participation in appointments beyond the Senate confirmation process to be direct aggrandizement. In other words, Congress, by passing this law, it seems like they're playing nice and saying we want a completely fair bipartisan commission to oversee our elections, but Congress is really giving itself some power that they normally wouldn't have. The statute here, therefore, violates the separation of powers regardless of the form that that implementation takes. And so even if the agency is really steering clear of enforcement actions, um, we really do have a problem. Now, <clears throat> I wanna say something that this case is part of a line of cases about appointment and removal powers. And um, it's in most of the case books, but it, it's part of different lines of appointment and removal power um, cases. And one of the things here is not only about separation of powers, but this definition of who's an officer and who's an inferior officer or a superior officer. And they didn't, this is still 1976. So they didn't explain this as much as we would have liked and as much as a court was going to have to do later, but this becomes a very big issue later, uh, later on in the aftermath. And so I wanted to mention kind of two post Buckley cases Freytag versus Commissioner um, and the SEC versus uh, Lucia, or uh, some people pronounce it Lucia. I've been told by someone who knows him that it's Lucia and or Lucia. And so <clears throat> now the Freytag case dealt with special trial judges of the US tax court. And it emphasized that these people's full-time status and statutory charter that spelled out their duties and salary and means of appointment, the fact that they had some non-ministerial functions and they got to exercise a significant amount of discretion um, and, and talked about those things, but said no one factor or combination of factors is determinative. The more recent case um, in, in Lucia uh, found uh, that the ALJ for, from the Securities and Exchange Commissions um, it were indistinguishable in these respects. And it, the case itself didn't really change much, but prior to the court's decision, there was a lot of speculation about whether the court would broaden the definition of officer so as to call into question the processes by which a, large, a great number of federal functionaries take their positions um, like uh, in the Social Security Administration, but the court didn't go that far. And, but the decision that they are officers brought into question whether the ALJs for other agencies um, have been constitutionally appointed. And just to really quickly, what happened in this case was the Security and Exchange Commission had adopted this, I think, sloppy process from a legal standpoint when they hired administrative law judges of just having their human resources person hire them like they would other staff members um, at the agency or other civil servants instead of them being appointed by the head of the SEC. And so this was an investor um, who was the target of an enforcement action for um, giving securities advice or advice, uh, uh, investment advice that he wasn't licensed or authorized to give and so forth. And um, so he challenged whether the administrative law judge who rendered an unfavorable decision in this case was even legally appointed um, and therefore his decision should have no legal force. And so then the case gets kind of strange because remember, we're talking about all of the, the ALJs. So if he wins his case, this potentially could invalidate hundreds or maybe thousands of decisions that the other administrative law judges had been making for years with the Securities and Exchange Commission if they were all illegally appointed. 
Now, in the meantime, as soon as the Trump administration took over, they had um, uh, number one, they're the head of the SEC just um, basically appointed um, all of the existing ALJs. And so this was uh, sort of confirmed the, the people that they already had. So at least going forward, the problem was solved. And again, cons the constitution would have authorized the head of the, the chairman of the uh, SEC or the commission itself to appoint or confirm these administrative law judges. But the question was whether these were essentially inferior officers being appointed by someone who was actually lower rank than the, they are from a constitutional perspective. And which seems to be what was happening. But the administration had cured the constitutional defect, at least for cases that were moving forward, which uh, in didn't make this case moot, but would make future cases moot um, or pending cases um, moot. And then that person, of course, could retroactively affirm the decisions of the SECs, the, uh, uh, of the SEC's ALJs that had come forward. Also, um, the Trump administration had decided uh, to kind of back off on litigating the case in general or changed its litigation position after it came into office, which created another very confusing wrinkle in the case. Now, um, we're almost done here, uh, but the court in Buckley refers to an earlier holding in an old case called Myers versus United States that the statutory reservation to the Senate of power to advise and consent um, to the removal of a post, uh, first class postmaster was unconstitutional. And just kind of a preview, we're gonna cover Myers in a separate lecture. And in my um, legislation uh, casebook, it's actually one of the lead cases. And in my administrative law casebook, it's mentioned in the notes and discussed extensively, but it becomes the backdrop for some other very important cases. And so just want you to remember that Buckley is one of a number of decisions that refer back to this Myers case, um, a, 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 very, a, a very old decision, and makes it worthwhile to kind of know what Myers was about um, uh, for how it affects so many of the other cases that we're going to be studying. Okay, I have a review question for this lecture um, that kind of serves as maybe an attendance check, but also for your own benefit um, to make sure that you got out of this video what you were supposed to. Suppose one party controlled both houses of Congress, either Republicans or Democrats have won the House and the Senate, let's say, and the president is from the other party and they reach a political gridlock. Could Congress change the law hypothetically, so that the Senate majority leader could just appoint the Secretary of Health and Human Services if there's a vacancy. Um, and the Speaker of the House could just appoint the Secretary of the Interior. Again, if there's a vacancy and the president is, has not been able to get someone confirmed or put up someone that's acceptable to the Senate who's from the other party, could they do that if both were subject to Senate confirmation? Yes or no? Now, I know this seems like a complicated question, but this actually should be a simple, easy question. And if you don't know the answer, then you really should rewatch this video because you missed the point of this little lecture. I also recommend if you haven't read this yet or you're not following, pause the video, read this question, and make sure you can answer it before you move on to the next lecture. That concludes our video lecture on Buckley v. Vallejo.